say it. Say it! Ah, hello. Hello, mm. uh, hello everybody. To a very s- uh, special. Yeah, this is a, a, a little impromptu evening edition of Bonus Round. So we're going to be a little whispery, yeah. a little quieter than usual, because, maybe a little less energetic. Because it's nearly 11 p.m. <laughs> also, it was 40 degrees all day, so we sweat all our energy out. Oh my fucking god, yeah, at work today... We had the air conditioning on, and it was just not doing anything. <laughs> it was no, not um, doing anything. And it I had got to wait. clogged up by all that construction dust and stopped working. I had to wait for the bus for a quite an, a significant amount of time, too, and it was like 7.30 p.m., and it's fucking hot outside. It's practically 40 degrees. God, it sucked. It was not fun. Uh, anyway, welcome to Bonus Round. This is our little bonus episode of bonus round evening edition uh and our subject for this evening is da, 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 favorite our favorite jerpers favorite jerpers, jerpers. so our j- japanese role-playing games <laughs> full of waifus uh definitely and mon- With big monsters busts. and swords and anime twinks yeah. Also, don't forget the revealing outfits. Oh yeah, so that, many of them, that and that's unlock. for all yeah. genders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's for all. No genders. discrimination. And very silly names. Many silly names, in fact. Uh, yeah. Quite a few, uh, though none as silly as the protagonist from the uh, the Wii game Arc Rise Fantasia, which is this kind of bad Tales clone that came out on the Wii. The main character's name is. Lark, like L apostrophe A R C, Bright Lagoon. Lark Bright Lagoon. Yikes. Yeah, and he looks like the most generic anime boy. Oh man, ever. that's a fucking. That's a like. That that they look like anime people that you draw in like an anime drawing course. They look like a Mark Crilly book, like oh straight God. up. That's yeah, what they yeah, look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that game is fucking ass. It's like a really bad it, Tails clone on the Wii. Uh, it's like no, completely no soul. But that would not be in my favorite JRPGs. That would rank among my least favorite because it is terrible. Uh, some fucking Rob Liefeld looking ass anime shit. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> it's really a, an ugly art style with like really like non-existent lines in the character artwork. It looks so fucking bad. The oh yeah, that game sucks. But um, anyway, we're we're gonna talk about games that don't suck. Exactly, and that's uh, what we're here for. Because the JRPG genre, the JRP, the Japanese <laughs> role playing game genre, uh, is very very expansive, and we've spoken extensively about like Final Fantasy and stuff in the past. Because we're giant weebs. Yeah, I think. We're going to make it a rule tonight that we're not going to talk about, like, the major, major franchises with the exception of the Tales franchise. So no Dragon Quest and no Final Fantasy. Because, yeah. uh... We're, we're going to bar those two because we unanimously, I believe, have gushed about them, um, enough. Yeah, exactly. the podcast. Yeah, I, 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 we don't I, almost it. every episode, I'm sure we've discussed Final Fantasy to some extent. I mean, you have a you have a full review of an art book for Final S- Fantasy. Straight so up, like, we know where I good. we know where I stand on <laughs> Final Fantasy. <laughs> How's that character design go? <laughs> <laughs> it goes. <laughs> it go big. It go big. It go ninety dollars of my money. <laughs> <laughs> but well uh, spent. Well spent. It is. A, it is a lovely selection of books, but. Um, so yeah, with that having been said, I guess we can just jump right in. Uh, yeah. I guess we we both were discussing this before we started recording, but a favorite of both of us is Golden Sun. Yes, I, I fucking, big time. I fucking love Golden Sun. Um, I want to legitimately say, and uh, if we ever invent time traveling and prove this to be wrong, but I think this is actually the first JRPG that I played through in entirety at the uh, age of like i want to say when did this come out came out in 2001 yeah. so yeah i was like eight 
Uh, I might not have got it the year it came out, but I'm pretty sure I did. So I was like eight, max ten. Okay, right? Pretty young. So I was pretty young. Um, I think this was like the earliest that I owned a JRPG. Like I played Final Fantasy uh, at friends, and uh, like maybe, I was like, oh, this is fun. Maybe and, Pokemon, you know, like, I guess. If, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I'm not. Gonna, We're not yeah. going to talk about Pokemon because say... those are almost a game series in their own right. They are JRPGs, but. They're, yeah, they're a separate like, class. They're fast and loose. Yeah, they're a little. They play a little fast and loose with the formula of Japanese RPGs, and they're also kind of uh, monster taming games, which are kind of their own genre at this point. Yeah, uh, and, and many well, JRPG I mean, series have aped that formula. <laughs> since. Yes, this being one of them, yeah. kind of. Yeah, <laughs> almost. I mean, this is a pretty rudimentary JRPG. Uh, it's for the Game Boy Advance, and it was developed by Camelot Software, who are kind of like this... They're like a, a second-party Nintendo developer who do a lot of Nintendo stuff. Yeah. Uh, like, if you look at their, you know, Mario Tennis Aces on the Switch, that's by them. They're one of those studios, but this is kind of their their little original IP that they helped develop, and um, it's... It was a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Uh, the g- original game uh, on the Game Boy Advance is like really simple it's got a simple graphical kind of art style it's a little i want to say almost a little pokemon-esque in terms of how it looks but the world traversal and everything about the combat system is a little closer to your traditional jrpg like final fantasy Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's not a terribly difficult game it's not like the plot also isn't very uh this is like not anything groundbreaking. No, no, it's it's it, it quite does standard. it does it does what's known like really well. I think some, you know? something that it actually does remarkably interestingly from other JRPGs is have like at least JRPGs of this tier, like kind of the smaller, more kid oriented ones, is that it has yeah. a rather it's a rather cultured game in that it draws a lot of inspiration from like I guess different actual world cultures to kind of lend it some flavor beyond kind of the general european medieval aesthetic that you would associate with these games like there's the whole world that you're on is very similar to earth like it's kind of separated into the you know two or three huge continents with a bunch of islands to the side and it's a flat surface so it's like kind of a flat set of continents on like a flat planet flat earth confirmed yeah exactly flat earth confirmed (laughs) um uh, we have flat Earth society members all around the globe, um, but yeah, Wayard, the area that they're like the land that this is set in, is kind of this flat disc, almost like a disc world kind of thing, where yeah. um, the continents are all aligned, kind of going down, and they look kind of like Africa and Europe and a little bit of like you know Eurasia, um, mm-hmm. with some islands to the sides. But a lot of the cultures on Wayard are kind of directly inspired by, uh, you know, ancient Egypt. You've got your kind of uh, I guess like pastoral kind of European hamlet where the main characters are from uh, and it's all kind of wrapped into I guess like paganistic mysticism and alchemy yep. yeah like all the magic in the world is called alchemy and it's all elemental uh, which is kind of dope and um, all of the, the different um, I guess elements have people that can kind of cast... It's very Avatar The Last Airbender, actually. Although quite before Avatar, now that I think about it. Yeah. Real-world culture-inspired places with elemental magic users that call are called something. You know, like, they're not called benders, they're called adepts. But mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and, like, alchemy is kind of like a psychic power, almost. Like, it's psychic magic. Uh, yeah, it, it gives you kind of psychic control over one of the four classical elements. Um, so they they call them Mercury adepts are the water ones, Mars adepts are the fire ones, Venus adepts are the earth ones, and um, oh, and uh, what's the other one? No, Mercury, Mars, Venus. Oh shoot, Uranus. No, I wish no, that would be I, so yeah. funny. Uh, um, oh, I forget. But, um, who are the Mercury Adepts? The Wind guys. And who are the Water guys? Hmm. No. I'm pretty sure I got that right. I think. 
I have no sounds, idea. From memory, it sounds right. Yeah. It's been a while since I played this game. It's You see, that's the thing with me is that Venus. this is not a game I grew up with. I, yeah. I didn't play Golden Sun until I was maybe like... 16 15 years old i yeah when the game came out when the game came out i was like six years old i was like a really mm-hmm. young kid i didn't own a game boy yet and i didn't fucking even have any idea what a jrpg was the only games i yeah. previously played were like super mario world and that was it like <laughs> ryan pre weebness i yeah no i i had i watched a, before common rider i knew a lot about like you know i knew a lot about video games because i read a lot of books and i watched my friends play them and i played them with my friends at their houses but because i didn't own a game boy uh i guess like my idea of video games wasn't fully formed yet because i just i didn't really yeah. get it but golden sun something i came to pretty late and i guess my appreciation for it comes from the fact that it's a pretty big expansive rpg for such a small console and it's very pretty to look at. It's got a great soundtrack. And um, the battle system, and I guess the, uh, the the depth of the gameplay is kind of like Pokemon. How, you know, on surface level it's accessible for beginners. But once you get into the, the meat of the combat system, you recognize just how deep it is. Yeah. Um, you also recognize that... Uh... Who, which one's fire again? Mars. Venus? Mars. Mars. Mars is busted. <laughs> Holy fuck, yeah. Oh, straight up. <laughs> Mars breaks the game. Yeah. Those... Uh, and if you catch onto that early enough, like, you're, you you're can, good. You can, yeah, dominate your way through the game if you have a powerful Mars adept in your party. Which you do as standard from the beginning of the game, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But if you know, uh, you know, what spells to teach this character you know what you're doing and i guess that goes to the goes to say that like the depth of the combat system actually comes from the genie system uh so there's these little creatures you can collect throughout the game called genies that you find kind of in the overworld map or in dungeons and stuff like that or you get them as like rewards for side quests uh or Mm -hmm. for like kind of expansive exploration they're usually rewarded with a genie like if you go off the beaten path you'll find one they'll be hidden in like a cave exactly and they come in you know varieties based on the four classical elements as well and you can equip them to your party members kind of like the badges in paper mario the thousand year door Mm -hmm. and that allows you to kind of change the moveset of your character uh give them new magic they're kind of like materia uh yeah 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 but also kind of like the badges because they also give you particular abilities so it's not just magic attacks but different kinds of techniques that you could use that aren't necessarily magic or buffs yeah like they'll they'll buff your sword yeah exactly Um, or they'll uh so it's like it wouldn't be a smart idea to equip the sword buffing genie to a character that doesn't wield swords you know yeah yeah yeah. stuff like that or you can like you had to think about it a bit but you can give you give them one that like gives your character a speed boost at the beginning of every turn or something like that they have condition based uh, effects and stuff uh they're it's really really cool and customizing your party with the genie system is what makes the battle so fun in the game uh but the stand yeah the story is nothing special it's it's kind of your standard jrpg quest but the interesting thing about it is that the immediate sequel to the game golden sun the lost age uh ba- which i have not played yeah the first game ends on a cliffhanger um, boy does it ever yeah have. and then the second game begins where the kind of uh where the secondary protagonist of the series in the first game kind of left the party and follows his journey up to the midpoint uh and end point of the first game and then continues to the conclusion of the game's narrative and you get to play as two separate parties and all of your items and stuff from the previous game can be carried over to the sequel Golden Sun the Lost Age by um way of code like password they give you an extra long password it's like three you know three pages long it's massive but it costs it it holds like all of the data for all the items magic setup of all your genies yeah which genies you have and carries it over to the next game jesus it's really really cool and that's pretty ambitious and it's very old school it's very nes yeah it's very yeah that's it it's very nes and it it's something that doesn't really happen anymore and never mm-hmm. will happen again no exactly because uh, it's it's stupid passwords are dead but it's super i cool. mean it's it's super cool like i don't think it's stupid because it's 
the only way they could do it, and it's straight up just lines of code for the game to know exactly what was going on exactly. and where to pick up. And I think that's fucking rad. It's very. But old now school. it's just like the that password is now just on the like storage device, and the game just reads it by itself. You don't have to put it in anymore. Exactly. But uh, no, yeah, for the time for a Game Boy game to do that and to give yeah. the player like that, <laughs> you know, it's people were blown away when you know the Bioshock games carried over all your choices and stuff from the previous ones but golden sun did it way before you know so did the bioshock games do that oh not bioshock sorry what's that i'm thinking of the developer bioware mass effect oh sorry. yeah mass effect bioshock. Cause, yeah because i was like i don't think no bioshock bioware mass effect sorry i'm a fake gamer girl i don't know what i'm talking about you better uh, sell that bathwater. yep yeah, sorry about that i i don't play video game because i have boob but uh <laughs> yeah, so Golden Sun, kind of an, an underrated little Game Boy gem, and it's, it's not gotten a lot of love from Nintendo. Matthew, uh, no, it's not Matthew, it's uh, Isaac. Uh, Matthew is Isaac's son, who is the protagonist of the third game in the series, which we ends don't talk up, about yeah, that one. That one ends <laughs> on a cliffhanger and doesn't have a sequel. Yay. Nope. Um, Thanks, kinda, Nintendo. Kind of shot your wad a little early, didn't you guys? But, um, yeah, the... Uh, character of isaac the main character of golden sun the player character in the first game uh is uh a, an assist trophy in super smash brothers and he uses his move alchemy which is kind of the, the big hand that pushes shit that you could use to push yeah. objects and solve puzzles in the game to push which kind of stages. pissed me off when i found that out because i was like well, just make a new golden sun please i know just it's, do it it's it's just a, a or like remaster tease remake i don't know anything i'd be happy with anything and there's and literally there are so just many a fucking 3ds port i would be fucking, so many I'd unsolved be like, fucking mysteries in that series because of like mm-hmm. the amount of like kind of threads just kind of left there by that last game yeah and like the reason uh well i mean we're i was gonna get into it anyway but the reason that i liked bravely default so much was because it gave me kind of that same golden sun feeling mm-hmm. of like this is cool, and like I like the dungeons kind of felt similar to me. Yeah, uh, they are a little similar. in terms of like finding like hidden chests and stuff. Yeah, kind of um, going off the beaten path. Yeah, and since like the bravely default thing has the brave system, right? Mm-hmm. And that to me was new, and it reminded me of Golden Sun because the whole fucking uh, Mars Mercury, yeah, the, Jupiter, the, the, the and G- Venus oh Jupiter, thing. that's what it is. Jupiter adepts; those are the wind guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, that was also new to me at the time, right? So, like, it just, it felt kind of like that Mm -hmm. nostalgic feeling of, like, whoa, this is really weird, and I've never seen this before. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I guess, yeah, just give you big nostalgia flashbacks, huh? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Golden Sun for the Game Boy Advance. Uh, Game Boy Advance and the DS, good consoles for JRPGs. The DS especially got a lot of great JRPGs. So did the 3DS. Yeah, even even just the Game Boy Advance had like quite yeah. a few good ones. T- tons of really interesting stuff. I love um, Magical Vacation. Uh, that's a pretty cool game. It's developed by Brownie Brown, who are like a weirdo development team. They did that bad um, mana game on the DS that's kind of like a, a dungeon crawler. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Children of Mana. Not a good game. Yeah. But um, nope. Bad mana ter- game. Terrible game. Really bad. One of the worst mana games uh, by far. Especially considering the other DS mana spinoff is actually really good. The one where it's like a, a tactical RPG. That one's pretty good. Uh, I don't remember what that one's called. I think it's called Warriors of Mana. But that game is actually rather good. Um, DS has a lot of good tactical RPGs, actually. Uh, yeah. But... I was looking at the list. And, uh... Yeah. DS... D- DS was underrated? Question mark. Not underrated. I think it it had a pretty long life cycle. Actually, it, yeah, it had a long life cycle. I, mean, the DS, I, just, I feel the like DS it's lasted underappreciated. From, what, 2004 maybe. through to 2014, essentially. Yeah, and that's that's a pretty long time. The, when did the 3DS come out? 2012. Well, no, I'm think, yeah, I'm thinking of the 3DS. The 3DS lasted has lasted quite a long time. I mean, it's technically still around. Yeah, but I mean, it's underappreciated. Yeah, the, like no one, I think the 3DS as a piece of hardware is extremely underappreciated. No one's making games for it, really. Uh, oh, yeah. And if they do, it's kind of brushed off. It's a lot of, sho- a lot of shovelware yeah. or kind of last-minute ports. Yeah, or like really not great indie games sometimes. Yeah, which is a pity. 
Yeah. But um, I guess the indie game equivalent of shovelware. But yeah. um, there's a lot of um, a lot of great kind of handheld RPGs on the DS, and one of my favorites it's is called Sands of Destruction. Have you ever heard of this game? I have not. Okay, so it's a Sega JRPG. Um, Sega? It's developed by Sega. Okay. And th- it reminds me sl- very slightly of like a PS1 era JRPG with pixel art. It has really nice kind of 32-bit graphics. Ooh, yeah, that does look um, good. I've seen that teddy bear. Yeah, so the, the series is really... In- the game is interesting it's a total standalone it has no anything else it's just it's completely its own thing and the premise of the game is that you are part of a group of people who are trying to end the world because it's so shitty and so unsalvageable uh and everybody who lives there uh, that's a human is suffering that the only way humans can liberate themselves from that suffering is to end the world entirely now that's what I call some relatable yeah, content. It's very fucking stupid, angsty teenage bullshit game. Yeah. Uh, but what I like the most about it is it's really neat DS centric battle system. It, you know what it reminds me of? Um, I know I'm I'm hesitating to remember the name, but what's the name of that PS One RPG where all the kind of commands are mapped out to the face buttons of the PlayStation co- controller? Uh. I don't it's it's remember. like a PS One exclusive JRPG series. Yeah, uh, I just Persona Five does it. Too, yeah, where it's all the face buttons. All the face buttons are, uh, which is a really good, really good. I like. It's that a nice. System. It's a nice UI. Well, that's what Sands of Destruction has. Uh, but the game is yeah, it's a, sta- a pretty standard JRPG. But uh, the there's a fully rotatable camera in the dungeons, which is neat. So it gives you kind of a different perspective to dungeon crawling because you get to kind of turn corners and stuff like that and find yeah. hidden stuff, which is neat. Um, which is a little like the Trails series and that Trails of the Sky, The Legend of Heroes. Those, those mm-hmm. games do that as well, where you have a fully rotatable camera in a lot of areas. So it's kind of like that. But, um, yeah, the premise of the game is you play as a, a human named Kyrie, who's um, kind of like a farmer who lives in, like, a farming village that pays fealty to uh, a beast lord called um, Ursa Rex. And the, the world is ruled by uh, people called the Beast Lords. Uh, they're essentially furries, like evil furries. And all of, <laughs> like, depending on where you live on this world as a human you're either kind of a second class citizen or like a complete slave um but humans are totally oppressed in this world and Mm -hmm. um the game begins as you're kind of called to ursa rex's manor to help him out with something now ursa rex is kind of you know i guess if we're going to compare him to a slave owner he's kind of like one of those slave owners that didn't really mistreat his slaves but still kept them in slavery um, yeah, so, he's like, do my shit, but exactly, I won't. So this character, I won't murder you. Yeah, this character, as far as a slave goes, Kyrie is kind of spoiled in that he's not, he's not being beaten. He's well liked. He gets along well with Ursa Rex. Just you know, Ursa Rex is still his owner technically. Well, um, yeah. a freedom fighter uh, breaks into Ursa Rex's house and fucking murders him, and Kyrie is framed for the murder. So he gets thrown in jail. And he's liberated from the jail by um, the person who framed him for the murder and recruited to her cause. She wants to destroy the world because of the reasons I said previously. And the rest of the game kind of goes as you you go around the earth and in order to destroy the planet or to destroy the planet, you have to collapse society and then collapse the balance of nature. So to collapse society, you go around and you you murder the beast lords that are the most oppressive and some of them go after you too which is kind of cool so you know you're being pursued in certain parts of the story or you're pursuing them and all the while you're going through to these different uh locales across the world there's four continents each one's kind of based on a particular season so there's an autumn continent uh you know and a winter continent a summer continent and spring continent i live in the autumn continent and each anything each of the continents has uh, an elemental lord who's kind of like the the one that keeps the nature of that continent in balance so you have to kill all the elemental lords and then you have to okay. kill all of the you know the people who are kind of the the rexes the beast lords 
so there's mm-hmm. you know there's Ursa Rex, Elephus Rex, Aquila Rex, who's like a an eagle. Uh, they all have kind of cheeky names like that, you know. Um, yeah. But uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, the other main characters are uh, there's Rava who is kind of like uh he's like your rival character who follows you throughout the game pursuing you and fighting you. he's like a lion guy and there's also the one of the one of your party members i can't remember his name he's a he's half uh like half beast lord half human and so he's kind of mm-hmm. like he's kind of like an uncle tom i guess a little bit where he's he's up there in the high annals of uh beast lord society while the human part of him is like kind of written off like oh you're one of the good ones kind of uh so he's up there kind of helping their the beast lord's cause but he joins your party in the end to help you destroy the world there's this little teddy bear who's an assassin and he is sympathetic to the human cause and thinks that you know you know i've been i've seen a lot of fucked up shit in my day because i'm a little teddy bear who goes around murdering people and um sometimes uh you're just done with the shit and you think the shit needs to stop so he joins you too um, but yeah, you just go around murdering shit. It's a very violent story with lots of wanton murder and destruction, as is the title, Sands of Destruction. Oh yeah, and most of the world is also a desert, which is why it's called Sands of Destruction. Like, the the balance of nature has already been tipped so far by, like, the Beast Lords upsetting the balance between themselves and humanity. That okay, um, yeah. That, like, the Earth has become, like, this fucking like shifting sand sea and the only safe places to live are those four uh season continents and that's only because they have the elemental lords there to keep them in balance so yeah that all that stuff's kind of uh explained and explored it's not a it's not a particularly deep combat system but like i said it's it's a really ergonomic one because all of the it's turn-based and the battles take place on both the top and bottom screens of the ds so enemies that are aerial are in the top screen and enemies that are ground based are on the ground um Mm -hmm. so it uses the whole field of view and sometimes the bosses are so big they take up two screens which is a thing that the ds did a lot that i liked it's corny but it's fun uh especially the ds zelda games um which once again not a huge fan of but some of those boss fights are really great because of the use of the dual screens and yeah. um you could do a lot of goofy stuff with the uh yeah it's it's, it's pretty gimmicky but it works yeah so well sometimes yeah. so yeah sense works. of destruction it's <laughs> it's cool i like that the face buttons kind of map out the different commands for the fight it's really fun uh i don't know if i'd recommend shilling out too much cash for it but if you want to play like a fun rpg that um has got like some neat uh like neat kind of stuff going on i recommend you give it a try um it's got like a you know once again the narrative's nothing to you know scream about or anything but uh, like it has voice mm-hmm. acting which is kind of cool for the time uh on a on a you know a handheld game to have almost a fully voice acted game is pretty uncalled for even if the voice acting's not that great and um yeah. no it's it's a, it's a fun one i remember i first saw it in an issue of nintendo power that was covering like 20 different jrpgs that were coming to the um the th- the ds and they had like a checklist beside each game they featured with like jrpg conventions and they were ticking off the boxes for if the characters had <laughs> The you know if the characters in these games followed the conventions of JRPGs like and yeah. character has amnesia character is an orphan stuff like that you know <laughs> character is shy but is MC so has to do the thing there's a whole bunch of stuff like that like gr- girl can, yeah. girl in it can kick your ass like stuff like that so yes please uh, yeah that was that's pretty funny uh, I was a I was a big fan of that when I played it growing up I was you know 14 when I bought it or whatever. But uh, I had a good time with that game, and it was uh, it was nice. So uh, that would be my uh, my weird little DS RPG. Nice. Well, uh, I'm gonna keep it. I was gonna go one way with it, but now I'm gonna go another way because uh, you got me thinking about DS RPGs. And recently, I have been playing uh, Persona Q2. Ah. And uh, I'm glad to report that uh, I haven't beaten it yet. So, I mean, I'm going to keep that in mind. It can still go south and be bad. But uh, Persona Q2, doing really good comparatively to 
Persona Q1 uh, for me in terms of a Etrian Odyssey clone with a Persona skin on it. Um, the story is more gripping than the first mm-hmm. one. Uh, gameplay is pretty much the same. Um, you know, it's it's a first person dungeon crawler, random encounters uh, with some like gimmicky dungeons where like this dungeon has spotlights that you have to turn off and now there's so many of them that it's a puzzle that sounds uh, like um kind of like the classic smt games actually because I, yeah. I don't know anything about the persona q series i remember when it came out a lot of my friends were super into it because they're really big into persona and they were big into the 3ds so they were like persona on 3ds yeah. get uh but i didn't know that it was an etrian odyssey clone and yeah that's i like etrian it's... odyssey i like those games also uh, underrated JRPGs. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. Um, like, I'm not a fan of the game style, right? So, like, just the fact that it's Persona keeps me in a little longer than I think I would mm-hmm. be. Like, I don't think I have... Like, I have no interest to check out Etrian Odyssey. Oh, okay. Um, I do believe that they are good. They are good games. They're f- the, but they're uh, only but... good if you like first-person yeah. random encounter dungeon crawlers. Yeah, and like mapping out the map and stuff. See, I I, um, I like that stuff because I mean I like the classic SMTs, and I really yeah. like SMT Strange Journey, which is basically, as far as I can tell from what you're saying, in terms of gameplay, pretty much indistinguishable from the gameplay of Persona Q. Oh, true. I was gonna pick up Strange Journey soon because I'm almost done for. Strange Journey is uh, a fuck of a game. I love that thing to death. Another one that yeah, I've, I, I've, I've heard, I believe I've, I've already spoken some... about it when we were talking about Shoji Meguro. Yeah, you did. I, I love that uh, game. I, re- I, I just I remember hearing some plot things about maybe uh, Dyson Sphere esque things, and I was like, "Well, mm-hmm. that's cool. I'm in. Mm-hmm. Straight I'm gonna, up, gonna gonna, gonna go. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> that's ex- that's exactly what is going on in that game." Uh, oh, like, so it's good. it's really fucking neat. Um, but okay, so Persona Q. There, so is the battle system kind of like the Persona series? Uh, kind of like see, a nerfed gets, version of it. Yeah, like a really dumbed down version. Uh, you, there's still weaknesses. Yeah, that's, and it that's still an locks SMT enemies thing. down. Uh, you don't get you don't get the. Um, the plus though of like if you hit a weakness you don't get a bonus move okay okay uh you can have up to five people in your party though which is nice and if mc quote uh, end quote Mm -hmm. uh dies like you're fine as long as if if you get party wiped it's game over but as long as you've got one person you're fine okay okay so that that's a little different it's um is i guess battle system wise Strange Journey is uh, more like SMT4. It's yeah. it's it's the battle system. It's Persona SMT. You got Aggie. You got your magic. Okay. You got your cuts. You got your gun. You got your piercing. Piercing uh, weapons. Gun weapons. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Knife damage. So it's, it's pretty much like that, and it, it does the Persona Five thing where all the face buttons are a different thing, so it feels really nice to play. Uh, no English voice acting, which I mean, it's fine. That's fine. All it's, the text no is on screen. Me, yeah, like I was. The like, game would whatever. have never been ported had they tried to translate it. No, after after the disaster that was Persona Q One, I can't imagine why they would pay the English voice actors. Yeah, no, that 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 <laughs> game was not very well received, and I don't believe it did exceptionally well either. Uh, it was. It's got like an eighty three Metacritic, believe it or not. Really, I don't remember yeah. anybody speaking terribly highly of it. Me either. That's that's a little uh, odd. <laughs> maybe yeah, I'm mis- maybe I'm misremembering. Labyrinth, eighty three. Wow. Um, that's surprising. Persona fans yeah. are big fans of stuff, though, so maybe they're just kind of biased. Yeah, maybe they boosted it for. But I mean, yeah, no. the The story of Persona Q one, uh, honestly, kind of meh. I I'd say skip it. <laughs> just go to two. Yeah. Okay. And you you can um, obviously they're they're sequels in name only. Oh god, yeah, no, like, I mean, because I, I, I read, I, I got sick of playing it, so I just read what happens, and essentially Persona Q1 ends on, like, and now everybody has amnesia and forgets that they <laughs> met other so Persona users, stupid. and oh my god. the two characters that were made specifically for the game are gone. I guess we, I guess like, we could tick the amnesia okay. box next to the Nintendo Power feature for that one, Yeah, huh? yep, 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 big time. <laughs> and, like, uh, yeah... 
I don't That's know. Uh, and I, I feel like this one's gonna do kind of the same thing where like because you're meeting people from like you're meet you're meeting FemC from three. Oh, it's like you're it's crossovers meet, of all the pers- Persona games. That's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. That's true. So it's it's big fan service, and I I can't imagine because it all takes place in the middle of all the games. Okay, and I know that because if you're gonna meet if you're gonna meet the MC from Persona three, I mean it's got to be sometime before something. <laughs> you know? I suppose, yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And uh, no, before you go hang out on that rooftop for a bit. No spoilers, but uh, no, no spoilers. spoilers for those who have not played uh, that game. But um, Persona Q, yeah, that's a. Uh, I I heard it has kind of like a music aesthetic too, in a way that like it's got like a sixties. Is that the first one? Sixties kind of pop music vibe, like a pop art. Uh. One. The first one, like they're all chibi. Yeah, I know they have um, like a chibi look. That's that's one of the things yeah. I remember. Uh, the music is just kind of remixed from what I could tell in uh, Persona Q One. It was all just kind of remixed uh, Persona Three and Four music. Okay, like just a little different, a little more poppy. Some some in some pop. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, this heat. Yeah, it's getting to me. I gotta take a sip of water. I get you. Mm. Uh, yeah, so like a little more poppy sometimes, a little more like chill sometimes. Mm. Um, but I mean, it's it's good music. Okay. It's it's persona yeah, music. I Mitch. Uh, I'm not gonna complain. <laughs> the OST for Q2. Uh, I think a lot of other people then show so show that so, Soji eh, Megaro did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it still has the Persona vibes, and there was, I don't know if it's still there, I don't know what the time frame was for it, but there was DLC to get, like, three tracks from Persona 5, uh, three tracks from Persona 3, and three tracks from Persona 4 as battle music, and the good thing about this one that kind of really helped it for me also was that you have a list of battle music, and you can just put it on random so you're not always hearing the first like thirteen seconds of the same song. That's the song kind of nice little hours. fan service feature that I would expect a game like Persona Q to feature. Yeah, that's cool. And they they only got it in two. One doesn't one have doesn't it. Have one that you've at got all. one you've got no. You got the same song throughout the whole game, as far as I could tell. And it it's really good, but it does it it gets old. Yikes! Real quick. <laughs> I, I I would find Real I would quick. find that kind of annoying if like the feature is just kind of teasing you by existing somewhere else. Yeah. So what I'm getting is don't play the first Persona Q. It's meh. No, don't do it. And the dungeons aren't even good in the first Persona oh, Q. Well, that's a fucking shame. Um, like I said, I'm still I'm still early in Persona Q two. Okay. Uh, therefore, I can't speak too much on the dungeon design. The first one so far is pretty fun. Uh, but again, it's the first one, so of course it's going to be the simplest and least annoying. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, pretty annoying. And I guess to shift away from handheld RPGs, because we talked a lot about those, uh, yeah. a pretty underrated console RPG from the GameCube, no less, and one of the few JRPGs on the GameCube is Bait and Kaitos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. Uh, this game is... When you look at it, you could almost call it kind of an unabashed FF8 clone in terms of its aesthetics. It's it's got kind of an FF7 FF8 vibe to the look. Uh but when it comes to the actual gameplay uh and the storyline, it's it's completely differentiates itself. Um so the series uh is a card based battle system Ooh. yeah so you have a deck oh, you have a you have a deck of cards called magus cards uh yeah. narrowly avoiding copyright there magus cards um mm. hmm. changed the letter <laughs> wizards of the coast with the big eyebrow raise yeah <laughs> mm. okay mm. but um i guess we won't sue you but <laughs> okay you don't, japanese don't, don't you win typo. again uh, yeah, don't typo it. But um, yeah, Beaten Katos is a card-based RPG. It's a turn-based RPG with a card-based battle system. Um, think a less action-oriented, actually good 
version of the battle system from the remake version of Chain of Memories. Where you, ha- you mm-hmm. have a deck of cards, and combining different cards you know, gives you increased values and different attacks. This is, once yeah, again, yeah, yeah. far before Chain of Memories uh, came out for, the, uh, for consoles. It was, I think it was a contemporary, though, of Chain of Memories on the GBA. So it was yes, just a good, a good year for um, card-based JRPGs on Nintendo consoles. But I mean, I I think I've spoken at length at how much I like uh, card based uh, JRPGs mm-hmm. and just card based like action quote unquote games. Those are fun. I guess is they're what you could call them. Uh, they they strike they 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 strike this weird nerve with me where it's just like yes, I want to sit down and play this for hours. I, and hours. I've always enjoyed playing card based RPGs and stuff like that far more than I've enjoyed playing TCGs mm-hmm. uh, IRL, but. Um, I really, really do like Bait and Kaitos because it's it's kind of a different game for the GameCube. Once again, one of the console's very few JRPGs, like on a console that has very few, it has some great JRPGs like Skies of Arcadia Legends, which is a a great updated uh, port of Skies of Arcadia for the Dreamcast, uh, which yeah. is a game that I really would love to own. It has Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon XD, which are not terribly impressive games in hindsight, but I hold near and dear to me. Uh, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Tales of Door. Vesperia. Is that on the GameCube? Yeah. Really? Uh, no, it Tales Vesperia? of Symphonia. No, Symphonia. Yeah. Symphonia. Tales of Symphonia, which is a game that exists on the GameCube that I uh, own and have played very little of, surprisingly, uh, but I should play more. And um, yeah. Paper Mario I mean, Thousand Year Door, which is a game that I uh, totally am in love with. Baton Kato's also has a sequel oh, man. called Baton is... Kato's Origins, which is a sequel prequel. Um, and that takes yeah it takes place like ten years prior to the first game, uh, and it's Ooh. about the rise of the empire that <gasps> oh. um, took over and is in power during the first game, which is kind of cool. I think my lo- like the game shop right down my street has this game. Oh, I think I've seen this cover there. Really? So I might go copy. Oh, that tomorrow. dude, you should. And then I'll stream so it what's really co- to take a break from FF7. What's really cool about Bait and Kaitos, apart from the battle system, is the look of the game is very much a JRPG of its era. Lots of beautiful pre-rendered backgrounds in these mm-hmm. gorgeously, gorgeously designed, meticulously uh, crafted cityscapes. Uh, there's like an, a city where it's like entirely covered in fog because they're sitting right at the edge of the cloud sea. Yeah. So all the clouds rise around the city like a fog, and it's so pretty. And um, oh, man. there's this. This is like this. There's this weird one place. Forest that, town. It looks cute. Yeah. There's this weird little like forest town that has these fucking weird like cartoon ass aesthetic. That's like yeah. really very strange it's and got- nothing like the rest of this, the game. Cow pigs. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking. It's it's totally awesome. So the, the game is really imaginative. The story is is interesting. The main character Karas or Kalas, I think it's Karas uh, in Japanese. I just call him Karas or Kalas. He is yeah. um, kind of an edgy boy. He's a bit of a squall clone. Um, yeah, I can see. Which it. is why I say this <laughs> game kind of apes a lot from FF8, um, which is also a, a game about fighting an evil empire uh, led by a magic person, but. Um, yeah, Karas has uh, a bone to pick with the empire that runs this kind of sky ocean uh, that he lives in. Um, and so he sets off to kind of, you know, take down this evil empire. Every <laughs> A story that we've seen a thousand times and we will keep seeing a thousand times over and over again. Because people like the idea of uh, destroying fascism. <laughs> yeah. But only in the video only, games. Don't make it political. Only in video games. It's not political. It's not politics in this. <laughs> this game is not. No. This game is not Antifa. This game is definitely Antifa. Um, but yeah, he's got kind of a neat design because he's got the edgy kind of purple anime boy hair. But he also has. Um, he has like one wing, like an angel wing. Some would say he's a one winged angel. So so uh, what? yeah. Was a... But his other wing was uh, cut off, and so he has an artificial kind of prosthetic wing. Uh, which kind of gives him a nice asymmetrical design. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's, I, he is I, a sword boy, which is nice, uh, like many JRPG protagonists. Is it is it gun sword though? No, it's not a gun sword. They didn't go that far. Damn it! Uh, 
They, they weren't. Square Enix was looking over at the character design like, mm. no, no, you guys better stop mm. that. And they were like, <laughs> Magic was right behind them like, mm. <laughs> we're ready. We're ready, don't. Nomura is just like, sitting there like, <laughs> don't give him gun <laughs> <laughs> just, That's a nice character design you got right there. What you, uh, is that a, you trying to, no, you're not drawing a sword gun? Oh, gun sword? Good. Oh, good. You better not. Good. <laughs> good. But uh, <laughs> needless to say, it's uh, it stands out amongst the GameCube's library for being kind of a very PlayStation esque RPG for a console that as many as few RPGs as it had had a lot of very non traditional JRPGs at that. With I want to say the only two that I'd consider traditional JRPGs, uh, Tales of Symphonia and this. Uh, the rest of the games on the console are, if they're RPGs, are weird crossover things like um, Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, which is a game that I do not like, at least the first one, because uh, it's this weird multiplayer Final Fantasy game that I think is broken as fuck, despite its interesting lore and stuff. It's just, it's broken as fuck. Uh, and um, like like I said, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Another thing which I, I have spoken about at length, I'm sure... Uh, at one point or another, I love the fuck out of that game. It is incredible. I think I think we talked about it uh, uh, on the spinoff. Yeah, episode we did. I think we talked about we talked about Paper Mario, but yeah. Needless to repeat myself, that game kicks ass. It's one of the best RPGs of all time. But it's it's a Paper Mario game, so it's kind of an unconventional RPG just by nature of its existence. Yeah, because <laughs> those games are pretty strange, and they they uh, buck a lot of RPG convention or poke fun at it. Um, but yeah, so uh, in, as far as like RPGs go on the GameCube, it's slim pickings, and this is one of the ones that most reminds me of some of the RPGs that were coming out at that time, like Final Fantasy VIII, uh, or um, I guess in particular, uh, kind of those those very late era PS1 RPGs with kind of like mm-hmm. the you know maybe like Xenogears a little bit. Uh, where they have kind yeah. of that particular anime art style with kind of the pre-rendered artwork everywhere. Uh, but it's a neat game. And, yeah, the system limitations. And it looks almost as good as the RE1 remake looks on GameCube. Like, it pushes the hardware quite far with those beautiful Yeah, like, I, I'm looking at some screenshots and it looks it looks fine. It's a, it's, like, it looks it's like a beautiful you game. could, like, release this today as an indie and it would be like, yeah, you know what, fine. Yeah, yeah and people it's, would be like, what a great throwback RPG. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's wow, it's a they're really doing neat the... little game. Oh, that's gonna be a weird era, cause you know how like eight bit and sixteen bits coming back yeah. real big. The we what, the polygonal throwback. The, the P- yeah, mm. it's too many polygons. Mm. Make it rougher. I feel like that's a thing that maybe won't. Well, I mean, the gameplay of games from that era have come back because you have people making games like A Hat in Time and Ukulele, like the Collectathon revivals, yeah. and there have been some like classic RPG kind of revival games coming out of companies like Tokyo RPG Factory. Um, yeah. But um, I'd say like people's nostalgia for well, those actually, games is firmly, uh, firmly in the, uh, I guess the gameplay, not as much the... But there is a... Fuck, what, what's the guy's name? Uh, oh, he makes horror games. Oh, um... He, he makes like one horror game a month. And they're very like PS2, oh, like early PS2 polygonal. Uh, hold on. Oh god, uh, it's not sweary. No, 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 no. Uh, babysitter, bloodbath, puppet combo, puppet combo. Oh yeah, that's true. He is doing those kind of tank controls. Big RPGs. Big aesthetic of like PS2. Yeah, kind of the the survival horror games from that yeah. era, with like the with the fixed camera and stuff like that. That's that's very true. I yeah. forgot about him. He does good work, and those games are like legitimately scary. Yeah, oh, I don't know terribly. if you played Nun Massacre, but uh, fucking horrifying. I've I've not played it, but I've I've seen people play it, which is not tantamount to playing it myself. But I kind of get what they're about. Uh, mm-hmm. but those, uh, yeah, I guess so. Maybe there is maybe a bit of nostalgia for those visuals creeping back too. Yeah, especially especially in the horror genre, I think because yeah. like you can get away with some shit. Uh, like I feel like there's his games are scarier than some like 
his games are scarier than like say Outlast mm-hmm. or uh, those kinds of games. I find anyway, personally. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. They're they're definitely. I don't know. Maybe it's because it's kind of going back to that lizard part of my brain that like so strongly associates horror games with that era of games specifically. Yeah. But it it gets me uh, in a way that some contemporary attempts at the horror game genre don't really you know Mm -hmm. which is nice i think uh oh it's why people like throwback movies kind of like uh what's that it follows which is a very 70s style horror movie in a lot of regards and it's it's a fucking chilling film uh yeah and the soundtrack to that thing is oh or the or the witch which uh, is another very 70s almost kind of uh well, that's a movie that reminds me of something like a, a Jodorowsky movie, almost, where it's got a lot of yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. esoteric imagery and strong religious symbolism, uh, paired with kind of creepy kind of art film sensibilities. That stuff that's kind of mm-hmm. really unsettling. It's something that yeah. I more closely associate with horror than you know '80s kind of slasher movies, which I don't find terribly scary. Yeah. I, I love them, well, but I don't find them yeah. scary. They're not horror movies to me. They're you know, no, that's it. Because we've become so like desensitized to it because it leaned into itself. Exactly. Too hard. I mean, the, and everything became the, that. the entire the death of the shock wasn't the there. death of that genre is scream. Like it, yeah, it's like it's like Mortal Kombat. Oh, right? totally. Like, yeah. There's there's nothing. I guess. Well, at least for not for the developers apparently, which really sucks. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's the source material. We're getting sidetracked yeah. though. We gotta <laughs> these jerpas were good. Yeah. I mean, there's there's tons. We, we'll talk about that on the podcast. There's tons of other ones <laughs> that we could we could talk about. I mean, like if you want to talk about great JRPG series that aren't necessarily big series, the Mother franchise, which yeah. I love, is you know, and especially the first one. Maybe I've, I don't know if I've spoken about this before, but the first Mother game specifically, I don't know what it is about that game. I know people love Mother Two slash Earthbound and Mother Three a lot, and I love those games too. Don't get me wrong, but there's something special about Mother One and its story that I really like a lot that Mm -hmm. kind of actually really I find relatable because the stakes of the game are kind of uh, I guess dependent on you as like a player being intensely empathetic towards the notion of somebody just wanting to see their mother again you know like it's deeply tied to kind of the I guess affection for a parental figure or a figure in your life who offers kind of parental guidance or, and love mm-hmm. and affection, you know, maternalistic affection. It's, yeah, it's it's very it's yeah. I feel like a lot of people can be like, it's, yeah, it's I a can sweet game. I, empathize with the, that. <laughs> you cannot. You physically cannot defeat the last boss by fighting him. You have to sing him the song that his mother is saying to him that made him fall yeah. asleep. Like that's the kind of game mother is and i i love i guess the philosophy and empathy of that kind of game i think it's very Mm -hmm. it's very sweet and heartfelt so that game fucking kicks ass and i think is really unique and you can play it now as earthbound beginnings it's been ported as earthbound beginnings uh oh true on the switch digital i think it's i think it's on the wii u (laughs) don't tell anybody uh or you could <laughs> don't worry nobody you knows. could find a, i'm sure a perfectly <laughs> nicely translated rom hack like i did oh speaking of shit ports for the wii u golden sun actually has been ported to the wii golden u golden sun is on did the you know wii that? u i only found out because i looked for it in the game boy uh or in the ds store yeah and it wasn't there and it was like here it is on the wii u and i was like are you fucking Jesus kidding me you're Christ. not gonna put this on the fucking 3ds the, the one 3ds place? can't run this game are you fucking nuts uh, anyway, yeah, that's thanks Nintendo. That's really fucking annoying. Thanks Nintendo. <laughs> I love you, but why <laughs> this, you is this is a really me? different episode than our E3 episode. Yeah, truly. <laughs> Sometimes Nintendo bad. Sometimes Nintendo yeah. really good. Sometimes Nintendo. Sometimes Nintendo do what Sega don't. Yeah. Sometimes Sega do what Nintendo. Sometimes Nintendo dicks. Sometimes Nintendo didn't. Ooh. Never tend to. Uh, you... You, yeah, take from that what you yeah. will. I don't know what it meant. But Never. It meant something to someone. Never. <laughs> Nintendo about Mother 3 coming to the West. Never. 
never. <laughs> it will never come. <laughs> you fools. You utter fools. Just I want it, I, I want a Nintendo Direct to come up and be like, and now for a classic, Golden Sun logo pops up, and he's just like, haha. No. You're very stupid if you think we're making this. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, stupid like, fools, you idiots, you complete bastards. Fucking idiots. It's like, oh, <laughs> Jesus, this is off-brand. Oh, man, fucking Nintendo. That's what they are. Nintendo, as a, as a company, has very little love for JRPGs. And I think it's just because they like to make games which that is... appeal to more a core audience. Uh, which is yeah. why Pokemon is their big JRPG franchise. Yeah, but, I mean, they have, the Zeno, they have the Xenoblade games now. Which I guess are technically Monolith Soft games, but Monolith Soft is basically Nintendo's second party developer at this point. And the the Xenoblade yeah, Chronicles games. Yeah, but they made are, good money. Those are not accessible <laughs> RPGs at all. No, but they make good money. Yeah, they do because they have. A... And took for fucking ever to get, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, because he has a huge z- fan fan backlash to the announcement that they were not coming to the Wii. Uh, and Project Rainfall yeah. that got those three really, really lovely Wii titles brought over. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there's a Nintendo as a company has no love for JRPGs mostly. And man, we can do a whole bonus round on. Oh, that's a good idea. Nintendo RPGs, yeah. No, well, no, like a whole bonus round on. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> uh, Spoilers. Do you have one more game you want to kind of bump? Uh, I was gonna. <sighs> maybe talk a little about bravely default um just piggybacking off of it sure. a bit because um although i think that game shits itself and kind of sucked after did you did you beat it happens no uh, did you i still haven't gone back did, i i need to i'm planning to i just i need to i need a break you know okay you need a breakly default <laughs> yeah because i i tried and i i think i beat two of the uh reoccurring bosses and okay. i was like uh, well i i'm okay. telling you as you pl- as you pl- as to. you plow through these bosses again and again the only ones they need to beat are the ones at the crystals which are not terribly hard yeah. some of the easiest bosses in the games mm-hmm. um as long as you go through those a couple times over i promise you it is worth it just to get to the twist in the narrative because right. the twist is actually rather shocking uh, I promise you. I I'll, promise uh, you. You will, I'll be, you will be interested. It. I'll re-download it after uh, after PQ two uh, is done. Yeah, it's uh, that's some good shit though. Yeah, albeit uh, gameplay is really really fun. Um, the easiest RPG to grind in ever, hands oh, down. God. So the bravely system is actually like a quality of life bonus. Oh yeah, totally. I think that's. I loved that they carried it over to um, Octopath Traveler. The, yeah, it's, it's not called that's, that's one of the default, main reasons I want to ch- check out uh, Octopath. Actually, is just because uh, the art style is it's kind of the same, but not really. You know yeah, I mean? oh, it's like, pretty different aesthetically. There's like a la- it's layered two D, but layered eight bit. Yeah, there. exactly. It's it's got uh, a similar it's, nice. it's got a similar aesthetic sensibility, if anything. Yeah. Uh, and lots of great lighting effects in that game. The dynamic lighting is what makes that game what it is. So it's, a, it's mm-hmm. a very Im- visually impressive title just on that alone. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. What did you want to say about Bravely Default? Uh, just the the like Bravely system was very uh, cool to me. Like I said, reminded me of like playing Golden Sun, and being like, whoa, mm-hmm. mechanics and uh, like the level design. Uh, always felt really cool the dungeons felt nice uh just overall a very very good game the narrative is like albeit the thing with the thing that i don't like uh that's whatever it's still a gripping story and i do plan on going back to it it's just the way that it's doing it made me have to be like i need to step away because i just did this so (laughs) i get it (laughs) (laughs) yeah um, it's it's a little yeah, taxing, especially I'll, I'll when you have it. other shit to play. Yeah, when I, when I like, played it, I was in a part. In, I was kind of in a stage of my life where I had infinite opportunity to kind of curl up at night every night and play like three or four hours of the game. Yeah, and I could just grind it. in just, between. Like I went to school and I would grind during my breaks from class, you know. So that was fine. Yeah, 
and like that's it. I've I've got too many things going on with the streaming and the games I want to play by myself. And, that, and like, having yeah, a child. It's too much. Yeah. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> I forgot about that. I forgot about the fact that I have a child. I'll, I'll, I'll be right back. I gotta go. Uh, <laughs> gotta go. Uh, Definitely not check on my child. But um, yeah, I, maybe I guess one more that I want to mention. I, I mentioned the Tales series before. The ta- I might not have played too much Tales of Symphonia, but I have extensively played uh, Tales of the Abyss, which is my favorite game in the series as I've played it thus far. Uh, might be unseated mm-hmm. by Tales of Vesperia, though, because let me tell you, Vesperia, just on its themes alone, uh, is definitely pandering to me specifically. <laughs> yeah. The most Antifa game I have fucking ever played, <laughs> where you play as Black Mask Antifa murdering aristocrats because fuck... Tales fuck of the... Nazi punks fuck yeah, off. Yeah, basically, Tales of Nazi punks fuck off, and it's dope. But, um, and, f- like, fuck the bourgeoisie the game. But, um, I, I have to say, Tales of the Abyss is one of the most, uh, I guess, meticulously developed fictional worlds I've ever seen in a video game. The amount of lore, just deep-cut lore, in that world is fucking nuts. Uh, And so much so that I'm not going to explain it because we have pretty much no time left. But Mm -hmm. if you're going to play any of the games in the Tales series, it's a pretty long series and it can be daunting finding one to start off with. But if you can find a 3DS version of Tales of the Abyss, I say give that a try. Because it carries with it all the best elements of the series, whilst also having a really great and fun, engaging narrative full of really likable characters. And the main character, Luke, starts off as a spoiled fucking prick. Like, really a a terrible person, objectively. He's a spoiled, selfish, ignorant fucking dumbass who has no idea what he's doing and is totally in over his head. Uh, But the game is about him changing and learning and that is the primary the primary theme of the game is discovering one's purpose in life and the entire game is about luke discovering himself and finding uh finding out who he is what he was meant to do and who he can be who he has the potential to be how he has the potential to be you know he he doesn't have to be the spoiled uh you know sheltered son of a of a you know uh, an aristocrat he can be a hero he can be somebody mm-hmm. who makes a mark, who does something meaningful with their lives. Uh, Do that so shit. So that game is is really dope. And uh, I'm just, I, like I said, the 3DS port, best way to play uh, a huge console game sometimes is on a nice little handheld. Because uh, handhelds are kind of perfect for RPGs, as I think our little selection tonight has clearly illustrated. Yeah. We, yeah. But uh, there, it's, it's a very good pickup and do some stuff yeah kind of genre yeah but it's also a good like curl up on the couch for like eight hours and forget the world oh exists. totally <laughs> and it's 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 just fun you know sometimes mm-hmm. jerpigas are very fun indeed uh so i guess that's probably what will be the first of many more jerpiga episodes of bonus round probably because uh, we play a lot of those damn games <laughs> Because we're fucking weeaboos. Giant weebs. God, we're such yeah. weeaboos. <laughs> but uh, uh, I love JRPGs and I love talking about them. Uh, so, and I'm sure the same goes for you. Uh, Indeed. So yeah, thank you very much for listening to our late evening uh, bonus round. It was a little rambly, I'm sure. But I hope that we got you interested in playing some of these underrated JRPG titles. And if you've already played them, sweet. Yeah, okay, hey, good for you. Dig, We're sorry. dig a little deeper. We'll find ones that you haven't played. For sure. And I'll <laughs> suggest something other than uh, I'll suggest something other than Bait and Katos next time. I know I, I've talking about it before already. But uh, yes, uh, have yourselves a good evening and thank you for listening to Bonus Round. Bonus Round.